Hi everyone, I'm FlagonHG, and this is the video of my attempts at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Y using only Electric-type Pokemon. The rules for this playthrough are in the description below, but in short, in addition to standard Nuzlocke rules, there's no using items in battle, no leveling up past the next Gym Leader's Ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. The Electric-type is a tricky type to complete a monolock with. On the one hand, a lot of major threats can be taken down pretty easily by spamming fast thunderbolts. But on the other hand, the typical electric type tends to lack physical bulk, and many are hard-walled by anything with a semi-strong ground type move. Plus, when you consider the fact that half of them are Pikachu with a new coat of paint, the average power of your typical electric type leaves a little bit to be desired. Fortunately, Kalos has a good number of electric types sprinkled throughout the region, and some of them aren't even based on rodents. This encounter diversity, along with the notable lack of any major character that specializes in ground-type Pokémon, make X and Y the perfect games for an electric-type monolock. There will still be some pretty significant walls along the way to becoming champion, but fortunately, there's never been a wall I couldn't break through. Unfortunately, though, I'm not the only one breaking through walls, and not everyone is doing it for the right reasons. Sometimes, instead of breaking through the metaphorical walls of a needlessly challenging playthrough in a children's video game, people try to break through cybersecurity walls to steal your private information. Which is why it's important to protect yourself online using this video sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network that allows you to safely and securely surf the web. By connecting to one of their over 5,400 secure servers, you can prevent yourself from the threats of cyber attacks with just a few easy clicks. NordVPN takes no time to set up, and their app makes it easy to specifically choose a server in any one of 59 different countries. That's a lot of countries. Like, almost 60 countries. In addition to being a safer way to explore digital content, this gives you access to movies, TV shows, and games that are region-locked or normally unavailable in your own country. By changing your virtual location, you can access content from around the world. German Netflix has some bangers. NordVPN also has amazing speed and unlimited bandwidth, meaning that you'll be able to watch Shrek, Shrek 2, Shrek the Third, Shrek Forever After, and whatever other Shrek-related properties inevitably come out, completely undeterred by poor internet connections. So, if this sponsorship has you ogre-joyed by everything that NordVPN has to offer, you should use my custom link in the description down below to get four months of NordVPN for free. Thanks so much to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get started. I start my electrifying journey by meeting my squad of rivals in Aquacord Town. None of the starters are electric types, but I go with Chespin so that my main rival Serena will have Delphox, which is usually the Pokémon that gives me the most trouble. Then, Chespin and I head to the Santaloon Forest, where I can catch the challenge's actual starter, a Pikachu. Kinda funny that it's taken me this many videos to use the mascot of the franchise. I name my new mousy friend Starlight, and together we embark on an adventure of a lifetime. An adventure where we dared to dream impossible dreams. Soon, Starlight and I would become champions of the Pokémon League. It isn't too long until we're ready to face off against Viola for the first gym badge. She can be a surprisingly difficult first gym leader in certain challenges, but fortunately both of her Pokémon are weak to Electric-type attacks. We aren't hitting all that hard with Thundershock, but it's enough to get us the first gym badge without any problems. From here, there's a massive section of the game we have to complete before taking on the second gym leader. I meet up with Professor Seximore in Lumio City. There's a fight against him where he uses the three Kanto starters, and with only one Pokémon, Bulbasaur using Leech Seed can result in a disaster if you're not able to end the battle fast enough. I make sure to give Starlight a few extra levels though, so we manage just fine. After that, I can head to Route 5, where I can catch my second encounter, a Minin. Technically, Plusle can also be found here in Hordes, but Minin has a better supportive moveset, so I'll gladly take her if I can only have one. Minin and Plusle are probably my favorite Pika clones, but for the question of the day, let me know what your favorite is down in the comments. Anyways, I name my Minin Livewire, and our rodent-only Nuzlocke continues. For another 5 minutes or so, because next I catch a Helioptile from Route 9. Static Shock is one of the few non-monotype electric types I'll get access to, and Electric Normal is a pretty interesting combo. I've also never used this line before, so I'm excited to see what he can do. As we head into the second gym fight though, Static Shock is staying in the box. To make X and Y playthroughs a bit more interesting, I like playing with the anime rule, which forces me to match the party size of all gym leader battles. Kalos gym leaders are notorious for having at most three Pokémon. 
So since Grant has only two Pokemon, it's up to the dynamic rodent duo. This fight is by far the one that gets most affected by the anime rule, because both of Grant's Pokemon hit pretty hard. Some might say, rock hard. He leads with Amara, and I lead with Starlight. We're able to outspeed and bring Amara to about 50% with a times 4 super effective Rock Smash, as she retaliates with a pretty hard Rock Tomb. Despite the speed drop though, Starlight is still able to outspeed and take out Littlefoot with a second Rock Smash. That just leaves Tyrant, who's a big issue since there's no easy way to take him out, and he hits pretty hard into my defensively weak mice. I switch to Livewire, who takes a hard hit from a Rock Tomb. We still outspeed and hit Chomper with a Charm, so his second Rock Tomb doesn't do much. Our Orenberry activates here as well, so Livewire should be able to tank another hit and go for a second Charm. Were it not for the critical hit. It's never amazing to have a strategy where you have to dodge critical hits, but with two pipsqueaks into a physically powerful dragon, I didn't really have any other options. Starlight does the best she can to kill Tyrant with rock smashes, but it's not enough, and Tyrant is able to pretty easily knock her out, bringing an end to attempt one. The anime rule may be a bit unnecessary in a challenge like this, but out of stubborn determination, I chose to keep playing with it as I go into attempt two. Unfortunately, in Attempt 2, Zeus and I find out that it was a bit of a fluke that I was able to beat Viola so handily in Attempt 1. If she goes for Infestation, it's much harder to win this first battle. I am able to win the fight against Viola in Attempt 3, but then against a random shelter, Static Shock goes down. And I was really looking forward to trying out Heliolisk, so I decided to just reset. Which leads to another wipe against Viola in Attempt 4. Pikachu is just a pretty weak Pokémon. If only there was some way to instantly double its attack and special attack. Well, fortunately there is. Pikachus in Santaloon Forest have a 5% chance to hold a Light Ball, which is an item that, as I just said, doubles Pikachu's attack and special attack. Not wanting to repeatedly wipe to a Surskit and a French Butterfree, I decide that it's better to just soft reset attempts until I catch a Pikachu with a Light Ball. Surprisingly, it only takes three more attempts for that to happen. This Pikachu is again female, so now that Starlight has a Light Ball, she's able to reliably beat Viola without any trouble. Attempt 7 is the run, folks! Nah, just kidding, I fully wipe to a random trainer in Grant's gym. This guy is optional if you can dodge his spinning, but I didn't want to risk that on my way to Grant, so I intentionally fought him and got absolutely obliterated. Ground types are rough. Well, after that, it takes me 30 more attempts to find a Pikachu with a freaking Light Ball. Fortunately, at some point between Attempt 1 and Attempt 37, I came up with the bright idea of seeing if I could get the Thunderstone on Route 10. I originally assumed that it would be blocked off until beating Grant, but you know what they say about assuming, right? It forces you to spend hours upon hours resetting a challenge because you wiped to a gym leader that would have otherwise been relatively simple if you bothered to fully evolve your Pikachu into Raichu. Evolving the latest reincarnation of Zeus into Raichu does make his Light Ball completely useless, but the added bulk that Raichu provides, in addition to opening up his item slot, makes it well worth the trade. Technically, I could also get a Sunstone and evolve Static Shock, but that would require doing super training, and I wanted to see if I could do this without relying on it. Maxing out the EVs of my Pokémon this early usually makes the mid-game pretty trivial. With Zeus the Raichu, the fight against Grant goes a bit better. Rock Smash does more damage now, and we're able to tank a Rock Tomb from Amara much better. Unfortunately, Grant still doesn't waste a Hyper Potion on Amara before we take him out. So once Tyrant comes out, it's out to Minin, who I again named Livewire. Her bad luck seems to have carried over from Attempt 1, because she instantly gets crit by a Rock Tomb. Fortunately, an Orenberry means that she's able to hit Tyrant with a Charm, and then survive a second non-critical hit Rock Tomb. By the way, this is the most accurate I've ever seen an AI be with Rock Tomb. After the charm, I switch back to Zeus. I'm still super screwed if Tyrant crits again, but there's not much I can do about that. After tanking a bite that activates my Orenberry, I decide to hit Tyrant with a Nuzzle. This paralyzes the little dino and lets us hit him with max power Electro Balls, which should now do more damage than Rock Smash. A critical hit Electro Ball actually leaves Tyrant with a sliver, which is pretty annoying because it causes Grant to heal. Fortunately, it appears that Electro Ball is just barely a two-hit kill, so Zeus is able to finish off Tyrant and win us a deathless second gym badge. That was close. With that major obstacle cleared, I can head to Route 10 to get another encounter. Electrike, Eevee, and Emolja can all be caught here, 
And as great as Jolteon is, if I had to pick, I'd actually prefer Emolja, since the ground type immunity and a way to hit grass types for super effective stab damage would be really useful. The Sky Squirrel is the rarest of the three though, so I do ultimately encounter an Eevee first who becomes the new Starlight. I can't be too upset though because Jolteon is a pretty great consolation prize and probably the better of the two electric puppers. Still, part of me wanted to let myself catch all three of these encounters. I probably would have if there weren't so many other electric types in this game. But anyways, on Route 11, I can pick up a second hidden Thunderstone, which I immediately use to get my prickly pair of a pup. I also catch a Daydanae on Route 11, which has a phenomenal electric fairy type, but cannot learn a single fairy type attacking move other than physical play rough. Not giving this little lady dazzling gleam is a criminal offense. But either way, Azula joins the team. Next, I head to Route 12, where I can catch either Pachirisu or Mareep. I've got enough rodents on the team as is, so I decide to go for Mareep, which can only be found in horde battles. Fortunately, I can use Honey to force a horde battle and avoid running into a Pachirisu first. After slaughtering his entire herd, I catch the lone survivor and name him Barry Allen, which is ironic given that he is by far our slowest Pokemon. After a relatively easy fight against Serena and some Mega Evolution lore or whatever, it's time to fight Karina for the third gym badge. She leads with Mianfu, and I lead with Livewire. Mianfu immediately goes for a fake out to flinch rodent number two, but that's fine, because guess who has Encore, sucker? With Mianfu locked into fake out, Livewire is free to hammer away at Mianfu with Electro Balls. I was hoping to get Karina to waste a Hyper Potion here, but Livewire gets a little overzealous and crits her second Electro Ball for the kill. Oh well. Alucha comes in next, so I switch to rodent number 3, who resists all of her attacks. With the help of a held rocky helmet and some super effective parabolic charges, Alucha is completely powerless to my semi-overweight hamster. Machoke is next, so Azula hits him with a charm as he just goes for rock tombs. And from here, I can just whittle away with parabolic charge. Thanks to the HP gained back from her attacks, Azula is never in any danger, and Machoke falls a few turns later. That wins us the third gym badge which means Ramos and his grass types are the next major challenge. Grass types naturally resist electric types, so that's already a bit of a problem, but the more pressing issue is that his Go-Go knows Bulldoze, which hits all of our Pokemon for super effective damage. This is mainly why I wanted to catch a Mulja on Route 10. Fortunately, with a Sunstone I got from Shallower City, I am able to evolve Static Shock into Heliolisk, and after waiting until Barry learns Power Gem, I can evolve him into Flaffy and then Ampharos. So now at least our team is looking a little stronger. As we go to face Ramos and his three Pokemon, I've decided to bring Barry Allen, Starlight, and Azula. Ramos leads with Jumpluff, and I lead with the fastest sheep alive. Jumpluff goes for a Leech Seed, which is super annoying, but then we hit him with a hard Power Gem. Leech Seed recovery brings him back into the yellow. Not wanting to take Leech Seed damage each turn, I switch to Azula, who shrugs off a weak acrobatics. Then, Jumpluff uses another Leech Seed, and we hit a Volt Switch that knocks him out, and gives me a safe switch back into Barry Allen. So out comes Go Goat for a classic barnyard battle. Barry Allen has leftovers, so it makes sense to protect for a turn and gain back some HP. Ampharos is surprisingly bulky, so barring any potential critical hits, Gogo actually won't do too much damage with Bulldoze. But it turns out that Gogo won't actually go for Bulldoze if he's already faster than my Pokemon. I knew this was true for certain generations of Pokemon, but I didn't know that it was true for these games. This AI quirk would have made things a lot easier if it weren't for the fact that Barry's static ability activates, thereby paralyzing Gogo and making him slower than my goofy dancing sheep or whatever Ampharos is supposed to be now, I don't know. At the very least, this means that we can hit Go-Goat with a hard Electro Ball. And even though Go-Goat is now Go-Going for Bulldoze, a few growls mean that he's not doing much damage. As long as he doesn't crit, of course. After a few turns of doing damage, I decide to switch to Starlight, who mercifully comes in on a turn that Go-Goat gets fully paralyzed. At this HP, I'm hoping that we can take out this Can Eater with a few hits from Pin Missile, but Starlight underperforms with a lowly two hits, leaving him with a sliver. This means that Ramos heals as Starlight hits another limp to hit Pin Missile. On the next turn, she kinda makes up for it with three hits, one of which crits, as Go-Goat again gets fully paralyzed. But then she misses out on the kill again with another two hits. How many two hit Pin Missiles until I'm allowed to complain? I mean, at least Go-Goat isn't getting critical hits and we aren't just straight up missing our attacks, but since Ramos healed again and Starlight proceeded to get three hits and then two hits again with her next two Pin Missiles, 
I decide to switch out to Azula as Gogo gets fully paralyzed again. Then I start hitting super weak electric type attacks as I continually get exposed to potential critical hits. If Azula dies here, it's absolutely Starlight's fault. Fortunately, she survives, and with a Volt Switch, I bring in Barry Allen on one final bulldoze. I use Protect for a little bit of leftovers recovery because Ramos does have one other Pokemon sitting in the back. And then a Power Gem finishes off the most annoying obstacle in our adventure so far. That just leaves Weep and Bell, but with Protect and Leftovers Recovery, we have plenty of HP left to deal with this gasping weirdo. He does try to outsuck Starlight as the game's LVP by missing two Poison Powders in a row, but even if he had hit one, it really wouldn't have mattered much. Two Power Gems take him out, and we win a battle that was simultaneously much easier and much more tedious than it could have been. That's badge number four. Which means we're squarely in the mid-game, and the gems of Kalos start flying by. Before going to Lumio City though, I head to Azur Bay and fish up a Chinchou. I name him Shazam, and while Lantern isn't exactly an amazing Pokemon, having a secondary water type is pretty nice, so he'll be replacing Livewire on the team. Thanks for helping out in the early game, pal. Enjoy retirement. Anyways, for the fight against Clement, I've elected to bring Barry Allen, Zeus, and Starlight. As Clement leads with the teammate that could have been, I lead with Barry. Emolja immediately Volt Switches out into Heliolisk, who doesn't take much damage from a Power Gem. But Heliolisk isn't particularly threatening, so we just start trading off attacks. I've taught Barry Bulldoze, which along with Leftovers makes this a pretty one-sided fight, and Heliolisk falls a few turns later. The same can be said about Clement's Magneton, who comes out next. All they do is set up Electric Train, meaning that by the time they go down, Barry has gotten back to almost full HP. This just leaves the previously seen Emolja. He does the best that he can with an Aerial Ace, but then Barry snipes him out of the sky with a single Power Gem. I wasn't expecting to sweep Clement with an Ampharos, but here we are. That's the fifth Gym Badge obtained. The best part about having beaten Clement is that he gives me the TM for Thunderbolt, which gives all of my Pokemon an incredibly reliable 90 base power stab move. Starlight, for example, now finally has a better move than Thunderfang. I mean, I do forget to teach it to any of my Pokemon before the fight against Serena on Route 14, which tends to be one of the harder battles in the game, but fortunately everything works out and no one dies a horrible death. It helps that most of my electric types are at least moderately bulky on the special side. After that, I catch a Stun Fisk in the swamps of Route 14 and name him Sheev. And as much as I'd like to use him, I don't see him being better than anyone on the current team, so he goes into the box to hang out with Livewire. With a little bit of training, it's time to fight Valerie for the 6th Gym Badge. For this battle, I've actually decided to bring Livewire out of retirement. She's definitely acting a little bit weird after her time in the box, muttering something about Darth Plagueis the Wise, but that's probably fine. Against Valerie's lead Mawile, I send out Azula. She hits a charge beam that brings Mawile to just over 50%, but boosts her special attack. And Mawile just uses Iron Defense, so Azula should be able to take her out with one more Charge Beam. Unfortunately, we miss, but it's pretty low stakes because all Mawile does is get off a super weak crunch. Our third Charge Beam connects, kills Mawile, and also gets Azula a second special attack boost. This brings in Mr. Mime's second. A Parabolic Charge puts her in the yellow as she sets up a light screen. Then, a Volt Switch leaves her in the red as I bring in Livewire, who moderately tanks a Psychic. As Valerie heals, we hit Mr. Mime with a fake tears that lowers her special defense. Then I switch back to Azula who gets hit by a hard psychic. Though with the help of a citrus berry and her cheek pouch ability, we get back to full HP. So I go for a charge beam on the next turn as Mr. Mime sets up a reflect. And now that the light screen has worn off, we're able to take out Mr. Mime with one more charge beam. This just leaves Sylveon, but now that Azula is at plus two special attack, Parabolic Charge does decent damage, though it's still not as much as Sylveon's Dazzling Gleam. That thing hurts. Must be nice having a fairy type that can actually use a fairy type move. Even with the HP gained back from another Parabolic Charge, Azula will be at risk to a critical hit, but I decide to gamble it, which pays off as Sylveon just uses Charm. Another Parabolic Charge leaves Sylveon with a Sliver, which sucks because a Volt Switch would have just won me the game there. Now I have to dodge a few more critical hits as Valerie heals and weathers a few more hits from Parabolic Charge. But having learned from my mistake, I make sure to finish off Sylveon with a Volt Switch, thereby winning us the 6th Gym Badge. Not necessarily the cleanest of fights, but a win is a win. From here, I can head into the Lost Hotel, where one of three potential encounters awaits. Magneton, Electrode, or Rotom. I really don't want another pure electric type, so even though Magnezone is phenomenal, it isn't worth the risk of getting Electrode instead. 
so I decide to guarantee Rotom by rummaging through the various trash cans while using a repel to keep away any potential magnetons and electrodes. I name the Rotom Buzz Shock, and they instantly join the team's rotating roster, meaning that two Pokémon will be hanging out with Sheev at any given time. Regular Rotom isn't particularly amazing, but by interacting with the boxes on the second floor of Professor Sexymore's lab, I can freely change Buzz Shock's form. This gives them phenomenal versatility and grants me access to a bunch of useful type combinations, albeit only one at a time. For now, I change Buzz Shock into their Wash form, but that'll change at various points throughout the rest of the challenge. After making the trek to Anister City, I get to fight Olympia for the final gym badge before the Big Team Flare finale kicks off. I choose to go with Static Shock, Livewire, and Zeus. Static Shock is able to easily one-shot Olympia's lead Sigilyph with a Thunderbolt. This thing almost always manages to survive with a sliver of HP, so taking her out in one shot felt good. Slowking is next though, and she does survive a Thunderbolt in the red, but then she just goes for a Calm Mind. I had a Chesto Berry equipped in case she went for Yawn, but she didn't and she doesn't get another chance to. Even with the Calm Mind boost, two more Thunderbolts after Olympia heals are enough to finish off Slowking. That just leaves Meowstic. This is the only one of Olympia's Pokémon I was worried about, since I don't have a super easy way to take care of her and she can pretty easily set up a few Calm Minds. So I made sure to teach Eerie Impulse to Static Shock so that we could lower her special attack. It turns out that that's a waste of time though, because Meowstic just opts for Psychics, which do very little damage after the Eerie Impulse. So, two Thunderbolts are enough to take out Olympia's Creepy Kitty, and win us a very easy 7th Gym Badge. As I step outside of Anistar City Gym to casually continue my low-stakes little adventure, I get an email from Lysander announcing his plans to... kill every living thing on the planet. Since... For the most part, I like being alive, it behooves me to try and stop this beautifully maned monster. This requires fighting him three separate times in pretty quick succession. Fortunately, his ace is a Gyarados, which famously sports a quadruple weakness to Electric-type attacks. His other Pokémon aren't much of an issue for us to deal with either, which is refreshing because these fights are almost always the hardest part of the game, especially the final fight against him when he Mega Evolves his Gyarados. Mega Gyarados is Water Dark type, so he no longer has a quad weakness to Electric type attacks. And since Gyarados is quite bulky on the special side, we can't instantly one-shot him. But I do have a plan for this. Lysander starts the third battle by leading with his Mianchou, so I lead with Azula. Mianchou actually just misses a high jump kick, so our follow-up Volt Switch gets the kill. But since high jump kick would have never killed Azula, the idea was to bring in Starlight and then outspeed and take out Mianchou with a Thunderbolt on the next turn. Now though, I can just bring in Barry Allen as Lysander sends out Pyroar. We get hit by a hard fire blast, which results in this weird visual glitch with the health bar of my very real Nintendo DS that causes me to freak out for half a second before I figure out what's happening. But then we retaliate with a power gem, which puts Pyroar in the red. I make sure to protect for a turn to gain back some HP with our held leftovers. But after that, I hard switch to Shazam on a fire blast, which crits, but still does very little damage. Now that I'm no longer baiting Fire Blasts, I bring in Starlight on a Hyper Voice, which does decent damage, but it doesn't matter. One more Thunderbolt finishes off Pyroar. This brings in Honchkrow third, because the AI always uses their Mega Pokémon last. Honchkrow obviously falls to a single Thunderbolt, meaning that now it's time for the Gyarados to come out. Lysander's Mega Gyarados knows Earthquake, which would be a huge problem for our team if it wasn't for Buzzshock the Rotom, who has the ability to levitate. So, my plan is to switch to Buzzshock on an Earthquake. This should then bait Outrage, which will give me a free switch to Azula whose fairy typing makes her immune. And then, since Azula outspeeds Gyarados, I can Volt Switch back to Buzz Shock and then repeat this until Mega Gyarados falls. It's a pretty brilliant plan. Except for the fact that Mega Gyarados has the ability Mold Breaker, meaning that he'll ignore Buzz Shock's levitate ability and connect with Earthquake, thereby completely ruining my plan. At the very least, I managed to remember all this before I haphazardly switched to Buzz Shock. But unfortunately, this means that I'm in a terrible position. Mega Gyarados will kill every single one of my Pokémon with Earthquake, and none of them are able to get the one shot. So unless I want two of my Pokémon to go down, the only thing that I can do is to have Starlight go for a Thunderbolt and sacrifice herself. I absolutely hate that it had to come to this. Had Buzz Shock been in their fan form, then maybe I could have avoided this. Though without that secondary water type from the wash form, there'd likely be some damage overlaps between Outrage and Aqua Tail, so I'm not even sure I'd be able to reliably switch to either Azula or Static Shock with Dry Skin respectively. 
Regardless, it still hurts to have to sacrifice such a good pupper because of some foolish mistake. Especially because this challenge was going so well. Being this far into our journey, and sharing so many memories along the way, makes this first death sting more than most. Starlight may not have always been the most reliable when it came to hitting pin missiles, but you can be damn sure that we could always rely on her for cuddles and fetch. The world will be dimmer without the bright light that was Starlight's life. May she rest in peace. Well, with the world saved and Starlight mourned, it's time for the rival bridge gauntlet on Route 19. This is one of the more deceptively difficult challenges in the game, since you have to fight Shauna and Tierno without a break. Fortunately, my team has a slight level advantage after all the team flare crap. Because Shauna has a Gudra that knows Earthquake, I decided that I needed to change Buzz Shock into their refrigerator form. This lets them deal with Gudra relatively well, though we do still take decent damage. Especially because I tried to finish off Gudra with a Thunderbolt instead of relying on hitting a second Blizzard. But since the Thunderbolt doesn't quite get the job done, Buzz Shock has to take another Dragon Pulse before Shauna's slimy pseudo legendary goes down. This means that Buzz Shock is sitting at around 50% as we head into the fight against Tierno. He leads with Talonflame and I lead with Static Shock. We don't outspeed, but Talonflame doesn't know a fire type move, so it's safe to just kill him with a parabolic charge that gets us back to almost full HP. No problem there. But then Roserade comes out, and because Buzz Shock is possessing a refrigerator instead of a microwave or a fan or a lawnmower, we don't have a single grass type resistance. So believe it or not, this Roserade, which only knows Petal Dance, is a massive issue. A critical hit will kill Static Shock, so I switch out to Barry Allen. But as you can see from how much damage he takes, it probably would have been wiser to get off an Eerie Impulse. Barry takes another Petal Dance and hits Roserade with a Power Gem. Then I switch to Azula, who would have barely survived a critical hit. This lets me get some chip damage with Volt Switch as I bring in Zeus. He takes way too much damage on the switch, but at least Roserade now gets confused. So I switch to Buzz Shock next, who barely survives a non-critical hit as Roserade breaks through confusion. I go for a Protect to see if Roserade will hit herself in confusion, but she doesn't. Instead, she actually just snaps out of confusion. So now I'm in a position that you never want to be in. I did the damage calc and Thunderbolt from Buzz Shock does about 25-30% to of Roserade's HP. Because of Stab, Hex would actually do even less. I spend about 5 minutes trying to decide if Roserade was below 25% HP. I literally measured the length of the full HP bar and the length of the remaining HP bar and tried to see if I could get a rough estimation. My measurements had Roserade sitting at around 33%, but you can pause the video and do your own calcs if you want. Regardless of whether I was right or wrong, I ultimately decided that my best bet was to go for the Blind Blizzard. You really, really want to avoid relying on a 70% accurate move especially if you're gambling your most versatile team member. But I have no other choice. So, I click Blizzard. I swear I was so certain that Blizzard would miss there. The wave of relief that came over me was indescribable. Without Buzzshock, the rest of this game would have been incredibly difficult, so it's a small miracle that I connected there. To be fair though, Blizzard still hits like 70% of the time, so the odds were very much in my favor, but RNG can be a hell of a drug in Nuzlocke's. Anyways, the rest of the rival gauntlet is unremarkable, so let's just move on to the final gym battle against Wolfric and his ice types. I've decided to bring Buzz Shock, who is now sitting warm and comfy inside of a microwave, as well as Zeus and Barry, who haven't possessed microwaves, but they're still doing a good job. Wolfric leads with Obama Snow, who instantly sets up the hail, but then Buzz Shock lights him up like the 4th of July with a single overheat. I've made sure to give Buzz Shock a wide lens, so overheat is 99% accurate. Wolfric brings in his Avalug next. Overheat harshly lowered our special attack, so I switch out to Barry Allen as Avalug goes for a curse. Then, after taking some Hail Chip and recovering said Hail Chip with leftovers, I switch back to Buzz Shock and a fairly weak Avalanche, all things considered. So, another Overheat turns Avalug into a Puddle. This just leaves Wolfric with Cryagonal. So, I switch to Zeus, who gets hit by a fairly hard Ice Beam as the Hail stops. Throughout our travels, Zeus has managed to accidentally accrue a decent number of attack EVs, to the point where his attack stat is quite a bit better than his special attack stat. So, a Brick Break is more than enough to one-shot the physically frail Snowflake, and win us the 8th and final Gym Badge. Which means we're off to the Pokémon League. Along the way, I have one last fight against Serena, but the most exciting thing about that fight is the Night Sky behind us. I guess I've never done this fight at night, because my goodness, this looks beautiful. 
I've said it before, but if these games were just a little more polished from a gameplay perspective, they'd be my favorite Pokemon games. It's a shame we never got Pokemon Z. But anyways, the final fight against Serena isn't particularly memorable, so we can just skip it. Which means it's time for the final challenge of the run. Here are the six Pokemon that I'll be using to take on the Elite Four and the Champion, all leveled up to level 65 to match the aces of each Elite Four member. These six have been the Pokemon I've used most consistently, so other than choosing which Rotom form to use, the Pokemon selection was pretty straightforward. Livewire and Sheev will be cheering from the box. For Buzz Shock's form, I decided on Rotom Heat, which will address a few specific threats that my team would otherwise potentially struggle against. So, let's see if this team of six has what it takes to avenge our lone fallen friend and finish the run strong. First up is Seabold, who for once is the easiest of the Elite Four members. If you don't have an electric type, his Dragon Dancing Gyarados can be pretty scary, but since we obviously do have an electric type, Gyarados and all three of his other water types are one shot by Thunderbolts from Static Shock. As a note, in order to satisfy the anime rule, I've pre-selected four Pokemon that I'm allowed to use for each of the Elite Four fights. Obviously here it doesn't matter, but it will for the next few fights. Anyways, that's Seabolt defeated. Second is Wickstrom. This fight is predominantly why I chose Rotom Heat. Buzz Shock is able to come in on Wickstrom's lead Klefki, and after getting hit by a Priority Torment, kill the little fairy with an Overheat. Next is Probopass, so I switch to Barry Allen on a Power Gem. Probopass has Earth Power, but despite being super effective, it really doesn't do that much damage, so I don't really have to play this particularly optimally. Which is good, because I don't. Things get a little messy. I end up going for a bunch of switches, and protecting for leftovers recovery, and accidentally leaving Probopass with a sliver of HP so that Wickstrom heals, and blah blah blah. It's not particularly interesting, but the end result is that I'm able to get Buzz Shock back in freely on an Earth Power, with both of Wickstrom's full restores used up. And then I can easily finish off Probopass with a Thunderbolt. So third is Aegislash. After he wastes a turn going for a King Shield, even though he's already in shield form, Buzz Shock outspeeds and one-shots him with an Overheat. So last is Caesar. But even with the special attack drop from the first Overheat, another one cleanly gets the one-shot, and we win the battle against Wickstrom. So third is Malva. She leads with her Pyroar, and I lead with Zeus. A Brick Break does super effective damage into the Lioness, who retaliates with a Flamethrower that doesn't do much thanks to her rivalry nerf. Then, a second Brick Break takes her out. Torkoal comes out next, so I switch to Buzz Shock on an Earthquake. A Thunderbolt does good damage, as Torkoal just misses a Stone Edge. I spent a long time getting the Charty Berry that I'm holding so that that wouldn't be an issue, but whatever. Torkoal falls to another Thunderbolt. That brings in Chandelure, so I hit her with a Dark Pulse. She just goes for a Confide, which lowers Buzz Shock's special attack, but the single drop doesn't stop Buzz Shock from taking down Chandelure with two more Dark Pulses after Malva uses a full restore. So last is Talonflame. Thanks to the special attack drop from Confide, I don't want to put Talonflame in the range where Flail would do a lot of damage, so I switch to Shazam who tanks a Brave Bird. Then I switch back to Buzz Shock who easily tanks a critical hit Brave Bird. So after tanking a Flare Blitz, Talonflame goes down to one last Thunderbolt, and Malva is defeated meaning that Drasna is last for the Kalos Elite Four. She leads with Dragalge, and I lead with Zeus. I go for a dig as Dragalge misses a Sludge Bomb. Zeus's dig manages to get a critical hit on Dragalge, which is actually really inconvenient, because it means that Drasna will heal. Had she not gotten the crit, we'd actually be in a much better position, because now I need to risk Zeus to a critical hit Sludge Bomb. I do make sure to nuzzle the Dragalge on the turn that Drasna heals so that she potentially gets fully paralyzed. And we don't get crit by the next Sludge Bomb, but Dragalge's Poison Point does activate, meaning that even with our Citrus Berry activating, Zeus has just barely enough HP to finish off Dragalge with one more dig. It's been a hot minute since I've been in a position where getting a critical hit on the enemy was actually a bad thing. But fortunately, everything worked out this time. The silver lining here is that Altaria comes out next, and since Zeus is poisoned, we can safely switch to Shazam without risk of getting hit by a Sing. Instead, a Dragon Pulse doesn't do much damage. Then we surprisingly outspeed and hit Altaria with an Ice Beam, though that doesn't kill because Shazam is kinda weak. Altaria just uses Cotton Guard though, so a few more Ice Beams take her out. This actually works out pretty well since Drasna wastes her final full restore. Third is Noivern, so I stay in and Shazam tanks a Dragon Pulse before he retaliates with an Ice Beam that leaves Noivern with a sliver. Then I switch out to Barry Allen. 
Dragon Pulse does way less damage to him, and Leftovers helps out a ton. Protect helps us get back a little bit of HP on the next turn, though it ultimately doesn't really matter because it causes Noivern to go for Super Fang for a good chunk of HP before she falls to a Power Gem. So last for Drasna is Drudagon. We have to be a little careful here because she knows Dragon Tail, and if she uses Dragon Tail to bring in Zeus, he'll die to poison damage. So I switch out to Azula, who instead of shrugging off a Dragon Tail, shrugs off a weak revenge. Then we hit Drudagon with a charm so that her attacks do very little damage. A Toxic on the next turn also puts the pile of Duplos on a timer. From here, Azula just slowly whittles away at Drudagon with Parabolic Charge and Toxic damage. I make sure to stay out of the range where a crit could kill Azula, but with the help of a Citrus Berry and Cheek Pouch, that ends up being pretty easy. Drudagon does get one crit, but it's not enough, and the poison damage is starting to rack up. So, with one last Volt Switch, Drudagon falls, winning us the battle against the final Elite Four member. Which means it's time for a tradition as old as time itself. If you're new to the channel, in my very first Kalos Challenge video, I forgot to click record during the final fight against the champion Diantha, so I had to use paper puppets to reenact the fight. And since then, it's become something I've done for every Kalos playthrough. It works out well because the fights against Diantha tend to be pretty underwhelming otherwise. Now, the puppets are back for this one, but this fight actually has the potential to be super difficult. Some of Diantha's Pokemon are pretty problematic for my electric types, including a Tyrantrum with Earthquake and Head Smash. So buckle up folks, this one's gonna be a doozy. Let's get started. Diantha leads with Halucha, as she always does, so I lead with Static Shock. We don't outspeed, so Halucha goes for Flying Press, but she misses, which is funny because we manage to connect with a 70% accurate Thunder. This brings in Gudra next. So I switch to Azula on a Focus Blast, which annoyingly drops our special defense. I guess that kinda makes up for the Flying Press miss. I decide to Volt Switch out to Shazam on a Fire Blast, which does no damage, but does get the burn. RNG galore. Gudra then hits a Dragon Pulse, which crits, our Citrus Berry activates, and then we hit Gudra with a Toxic. Then it's back to Azula on a Dragon Pulse. I use Confide to lower Gudra's special attack on the next turn as Azula tanks a Fire Blast. Then I Volt Switch out to Zeus who dodges a Fire Blast. Unfortunately, the poison damage puts Gudra into the red, so Diantha uses a full restore, though at least Zeus uses the opportunity to nuzzle Gudra. Then it's back to Azula on a Dragon Pulse. And then another Confide as she gets fully paralyzed. A third Confide means that a Fire Blast doesn't do much to Azula, who gets back to almost full HP with a Citrus Berry and Cheek Pouch. With a Volt Switch, I bring in Zeus on a weak Fire Blast. Then we hit Gudra with a Brick Break for good damage, as Gudra retaliates with a Dragon Pulse. So I switch to Azula one last time on a Dragon Pulse. And with one last Volt Switch, it's off to Barry Allen, who manages to avoid a Focus Blast. All of that obnoxious pivoting was so that I could safely bring in Barry, who is now able to kill Gudra with a Dragon Pulse, which they decided to give to Ampharos as a level up move just so that they could justify his ridiculous part dragon mega evolution. With Gudra finally taken care of, Tyrantrum is next, and he's just plain scary. Even without Earthquake, Head Smash does a disgusting amount of damage. I switch to Shazam, planning to sacrifice him to get a free switch into Azula, but Tyrantrum straight up misses a Head Smash on the switch, which is amazing because it means that Shazam is able to hit him with a hard Ice Beam. It's not enough for the kill, so sadly our fishy friend still falls to a follow-up Head Smash, though the recoil is enough to also take out Tyrantrum. So thank you for your sacrifice, Shazam. I hope you enjoy Fishy Heaven. Zeus comes in to replace Shazam as Diantha brings in Aurora's fourth. A Brick Break is enough to one-shot Aurora's. We've really come a long way since Grant, huh? That means that the final Pokemon before Diantha's Mega Gardevoir is Gorgeist. I switch to Buzz Shock as Gorgeist goes for Shadow Force. So then I switch out to Static Shock, whose normal type makes him immune to the attack. Then it's back to Buzz Shock, who gets hit by a Trick or Treat, but that's fine, because a Dark Pulse causes Gorgeist to flinch on the next turn. And then after Diantha tries to heal, Gorgeist goes down to a few more Dark Pulses. Buzz Shock has had an absolutely phenomenal performance at the Kalos Pokemon League, but I do need them to make a sacrifice for the sake of the team, because Diantha's Gardevoir is pretty scary. As she comes in and Mega evolves, Buzz Shock nails her with a Thunder Wave to guarantee that our remaining four Pokemon in the back can outspeed her. As a result though, this exposes them to a nasty attack from Mega Gardevoir that's sure to kill. Unless Gardevoir gets fully paralyzed. Okay, well I guess it's off to Static Shock on a Shadow Ball. 
Then we hit Gardevoir with an Eerie Impulse, meaning that Gardevoir is going to need a lot of critical hits to clutch this one out. She doesn't get a crit, but Moonblast does drop our special attack. So I switch out to Barry Allen, who also has his special attack dropped by Moonblast. So it's off to Azula, as Gardevoir now gets fully paralyzed. Then it's just a Volt Switch for a tick of damage to bring Buzzshock back in, as Gardevoir gets fully paralyzed once again. So Buzzshock nails her with a Thunderbolt as she retaliates with a Psychic. And then, with one final Thunderbolt, Gardevoir falls, winning us the battle and the run. That was, by far, the longest and most RNG-heavy Diantha fight I've ever had. I don't know if longer fights are as coherent when adapted into the paper puppet medium, but hopefully you still like the bit. This challenge was a lot of fun, and it was really cool to get to use Pokémon like Heliolisk in this playthrough. The way the difficulty level fluctuated was pretty interesting as well. Sometimes the challenge was on the easier side, but there were obstacles that were much harder than I was expecting. R.I.P. Starlight. That one will take some time to get over. If you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges. You should also subscribe to my Highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And be sure to join the Flag on HG community Discord where you can discuss Nuzlocking and contribute to future challenges. The links are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.